Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Preservation School class about the Bridge to Crafts program at Greenwood Cemetery. Our next Preservation School class, all about architectural medals with Allen Architectural Medals, will be on January 23rd. We also have a tour of 50 Nevern Street, a historic building that has been adaptively reused for affordable housing on, on Monday, January 22nd. Information about all our upcoming programming can be found on our website, hdc.org. If you have any questions about programming, you can contact me at marbulu at hdc.org. Tonight's class will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel for free viewing. You may also watch all of our previous Preservation School classes and virtual tours on our YouTube channel. I would like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, City Council, and the New York State Council on the Arts for supporting Preservation School. Now I will hand it over to the Director of Restoration and Preservation at Greenwood Cemetery, Neela Wickramsey. Thank you. Hi there. Great to see everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, before I share my screen, I'm just gonna give you all a little bit of a rundown about what you're gonna see tonight. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background on myself, the work that I do on Greenwood and our most recent uh, large scale restoration project that we um, completed during our Bridge to Crafts Careers uh, pro uh, program. The Bridge to Crafts Careers program is a yearly uh, adult workforce development program that I teach. Um, and it allows folks that are maybe wanting to get into construction or restoration, the ability to learn hands-on and figure out if it's for them. So give me one second while I share my screen and we're gonna jump right in. And if anyone has any questions, just throw them into the chat and we can um, make sure that we can get to them at the end of the presentation. And if everyone can please stay muted, thank you. Great. Michelle, we're looking good? Yep, yeah, looks good. Awesome, all right. So that's me and one of my uh, students from last year, Hannah. And uh, this is a typical day for our restoration program, me on a roof of some sort, hopefully teaching someone about the work that we do um, hands on. Um, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, welcome. Um, the place that I work at Greenwood Cemetery is a fantastic place, uh, 478 acres in South Brooklyn. And it's really a wonderland of historic monuments and a who's who of a Brooklyn and New York. So if you haven't come to see us in person, please, please, please come to see us in person. It's a wonderful place to get to know a little bit more about historic architecture um, and really experience a, a magical uh, place in Southern Brooklyn. So please come to see us in person. Um, like any good historian, before we go uh, forward, we have to go back. Um, so I want to just show you this slide because we have to go backwards to see all of the past programs uh, and their cohorts that I've hosted from, uh, I think the first year that I had uh, students was 2018. And this is this program at its heart is really the brainchild of, of many different people. And I run this program in collaboration with the World Monuments Fund um, and Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. The World Monuments Fund is an international uh, preservation advocacy um, group that if you've traveled anywhere around the world, you know that the World Monuments Fund has been really a uh, key in raising money and raising awareness about the importance of historic preservation throughout the entire world. And Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow is a local social services provider in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And without them, I could not make this program work. I help folks learn about construction. They help folks gain the jobs um, that they want in construction. So it is, it is definitely a partnership that we are very proud of. Um, and also, we wouldn't be anywhere in this program without our, our friends up at Woodlawn Cemetery. Woodlawn Cemetery hosted this program for a few years before we got into it. Um, and it was really in with their help that we were able to uh, figure it out at Greenwood. So big help to them too. Um, our first project that we were able to do with Bridge to Crafts Careers in 2018 was the Miller Mausoleum. And you can see, I'm just gonna go quickly through a couple of before and afters, stark uh, comparisons uh, at the beginning of our program and at the end. Um, 2019, we were able to do another really great um, vault 
that had been kind of hiding in plain sight. Uh, and we had some really great results again. In 2020, I was all set to, my, my scaffolding was up. It was the second week of March. I was ready to have my, my students start. I said to myself, what could go wrong? Um, a lot went wrong, as we all know, in, in March 2020. But this this project, we actually, we postponed and I was able to complete this with uh, within with just me and my me and my two staff members. So uh, we weren't able to have a program that year, but we did complete the restoration project. In 2021, we did a very unique um, marble and um, granite mausoleum, the garrison mausoleum. Again, exceptional results uh, that we see in the before and after. And in 2022, the Phelps mausoleum. And finally, it brings us to last year's uh, project in 2023, which is the Delafield Vault. And if you've noticed that I'm using the word mausoleum and vault, technically a vault, which you see here, has one main front facade and is built into a hillside. And a mausoleum is a freestanding building. So it's a little bit of a difference, um, but they do have a difference. And just to orient you, um, to make sure you know where we are, this is Greenwood, 478 acres. And the Delafield Vault site is found on the top of Ravine Path on Oak Avenue, looking down over on the back of Sylvan Water. So not so far from our Fourth Avenue entrance, if you're familiar with that entrance, but still, you know, a little bit of a hike into the cemetery. Um, and the site conditions here, as you can see, is it is a vault built into a hillside, and we have a little bit of a path in the front, and you can see that. The site plan here shows that there's this little garden section in the front with the central path, the main vault, and then another vault. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, the site conditions here you can see is one of my team members is working on steam cleaning the back. You can really see the whole site of the area. So it really is fit into our landscape. So before I begin any of the construction work on any of my projects, I have to begin with research. Research is a key um, element into any of the work that we do in historic preservation. Um, and thankfully, um, Greenwood has access to a lot of different, um, a lot of the original uh, blueprints for many of our historic vaults and mausoleums. So as you can see um, with this, I'm sorry, the, the quality isn't great, but there are many different elements that were uh, highlighted in the architectural drawings. And here you can see, uh, I pulled out a detail. It says, plan of the parish and Delafield vault at Greenwood Cemetery. This vault was built under the super in, uh, superintendents and engineering of Major Richard Delafield, United States Co uh, Corps of Engineers during the year 1853. So right there, I have my construction date. It's on the front of the, uh, the vault. And then below, I see F. Delancey Robinson, architect, 1933 changes. So the family was involved in interring people in this structure all the way through. Um, and it's great to have these original documents because it really guides the work that we do. Um, I also have some details here of the interior door of the vault that we'll see some photographs of. Um, and this is great because if any of these architectural details were missing, I have the evidence of those here. And this is another another great shot of uh, one of the original blueprints. Okay, so after blueprints or any measured drawings, I move on to historic images. So historic cemeteries are wonderful because we often keep these photographs because there's been a complaint by the family, there's been some sort of changes, and um, we were able to locate two photographs um, from the 1930s and the 1950s of the Delafield Vault and you can see the one on the left from the 30s, um, that was actually made from a published book from the family corporation. Um, and then the one in the, in the 50s was in our archives. Um, and you can see that there's a little bit of a change between the, these two, and then we'll, we'll get into those uh, kind of big changes in a little bit. So here are the details, right? So right off the bat, when I see the building in front of me, I can tell there is something missing, right? So I have two twin obelisks uh, in the 1935 photographs that are now on the floor in the 1950 photograph. The central gate 
I can see is a, painted a very light color. It is a black and white photograph, but I can see that it's not painted black. And there is a central path going to the, the front door of the, um, the vault. And I can see in the 2023 photograph, I don't see these things. So I'm, I'm missing two obelisks. I don't see the path anymore. And the central entryway gate has been painted black. So all of these things come together to create major significant changes over time. Um, and it's our job as conservators and restoration professionals to make sure that we can at least try to get these things back to where they should be. Um, after I do my research, I, I create an existing conditions report or an inspection and conservation report where I look into all of these um, issues that we see from structural to you know, building defects, all these things. Um, and for us, I'm, I'm looking for evidence of what was there. So in architectural terms, we're looking for ghosts, right? So when I was looking up on this wall here, I found the footprint of uh, where the obelisk should have been. So I see my missing elements as we went through, and we're going to go through each of these details as, uh, along with the existing conditions and some of the major issues that this building was suffering from. Um, so the conservation issues within this structure included a lot of concrete cracking on the French drain that was a later addition. And because of that added concrete on the top, we see a lot of efflorescence or salt staining in the front of the retaining wall. Um, because that concrete was added in the back, which is not a permeable material, the water that was coming down behind that uh, retaining wall was getting pushed to the bottom. And when the water came out through the open joints, it was leaving the salt behind, which we see a lot in uh, a lot of different applications. So it had built up over the years, kind of like a calcium carbonate that you see um, inside a cave. Some other issues were uh, what we like to say, or we call them in the business, unsympathetic, unsympathetic repairs, right? Um, Repairs that should not have been done in the way that they were, but here we are. So I, uh, caulk was used to cover over cracks and um, joints that should have been filled with mortar were covered over with what looked like an interior grade white silicone caulk. Um, that caused a lot of issues. When you add a waterproofing or very strange uh, decision to add caulk over everything that traps water behind these joints. And when water tries to get out, it gets stuck. And instead of going through the joint, it goes through the substrate or the marble in this case. So I see vegetation coming through on a lot of these open joints. I see a very dirty substrate, and that's the marbles are a substrate, and water path issues. So What's going on here also is chip marble, missing marble, and a dirty substrate. So this building was really suffering more from bad repairs rather than just because of age, which happens a lot. Um, and it was everywhere. Every single um, joint was covered with silicone um, and it was terrible. It's very messy to remove. It is not meant to be there um, and it makes our job a lot worse. Um, I often ask myself, why did this happen? Uh, it's because someone really meant to do the best work they could, but they didn't have the right information. No one sets out to do bad repairs. They just have, they don't have the right information. So as we say at Greenwood, if we knew better, we would do better, right? So um, again, the repairs are really bad, um, but they come from trying to fix a problem. Um, but these were some of the major issues that we had to deal with. Um, on the Delafield vault. So the interior conditions, that's when I open that main um, central cast iron gate. There's a, behind there is a solid stone door, which is very common. Um, and you can see that cross on the inside, which is really cool. Um, and you can see that behind the cast iron gate, a piece of plywood was applied on the back. Um, and that would was probably done to keep out leaves and stuff. Someone thought they were being really good adding that, but it really kind of went against the original design intent. Um, and something else that was really cool on the interior was that there was a site plan 
of the Delafield vault carved on the inside in the left-hand wall, which shows you all of the places to put um, remains on the, on the main vault and on the vault that's behind. So this half moon shows the central garden and then coming into this the secondary entrance of the vault. And you can see that there's actually an underground vault and that's what this, this um, demarcates a stairs in the back that you'd have to dig down to get access to. So it's a really cool. And I've never seen this type of um, carving in any of our other vaults. So this was really great. The interior conditions behind the stone door um, was very common, uh, a barrel vault made out of bricks. And then you can see the crypt covers here that were also marble. And then in between each of the crypt covers, uh, this is Tennessee pink limestone, um, which was in really great shape. And then these bronze rosettes on each one. And this is either side of the barrel vault. So everything is in pretty good condition. Some flaking of the lime wash, which is completely, that's, as we say, commiserate with age and no big leaks. Um, so I was pretty pleased with everything that I saw on the inside. And you can see that there's many blanks. So they didn't have, they have, they have yet to fill this. Um, so I've talked a lot about the research and the preparation that I do before I have anyone step foot on the site or before I even make a plan for the building. Um, but when I get my class together and I finally get my 14 students or however many I have, um, before they step foot on a job site, we do a lot of classroom work um, to make sure that they are ready mentally and physically to do this kind of work. And a key part of their training before they get on the job site is their OSHA certifications. Um, a career in construction cannot begin without these certifications. So it's incredibly important that I set up my students for success in that way. So we front load all of our OSHA certifications within the Bridge to Crafts Careers program to make sure that they know what they're getting into, that they see all different kinds of visual examples of the work that they're hoping to do, um, because it can be quite jarring to describe the work and people think they know what they're getting into, but many, many people are really kind of, you know, not used to it if they've never done it before. Um, so we give our students the opportunity to get their OSHA 30, um, their four hour supported scaffolding card and their 16 hour suspended scaffolding card. And that includes silica awareness, construction site flagging, and a lot of other smaller certifications to give them, you know, everything they need so that nothing stands in their way from, uh, applying for a job and then that employer taking them on. So an employer might want to take on a uh, an employee, but they ha don't have those certifications. And legally, you can't hire that person without them. So um, we're really able to set them up in the best way possible. And you can see once they get on my site, I'm able to have them practice, you know, putting up scaffolding, taking down scaffolding, and being in and around a construction site on a very low stakes um, landscape that facilitates learning above all else. Um, and uh, for the training that I do, I teach them how to use safely an angle grinder, a blower, all types of hammers, you know, a five and one mason's brush, all the tools that we use every day when we're pointing uh, buildings. And when I say pointing, I mean, we are removing the old mortar and putting new mortar in. Um, and having confidence with these types of hand tools and with uh, power tools allows students to really learn in a safe way. Um, and you can get a lot of confidence that way, which is something that's important. Um, I don't have students just jump onto a scaffolding after they finish their OSHA class. I don't want them to hurt the building. I care very much about it and I don't want them to hurt themselves. So, uh, at Greenwood, what I've done is we take a back wall of one of our garages and I have them for a whole week. They take out the mortar, they put in the mortar. They take it out, they put it in, they take it out, they put it in. Um, first, they take it out by hand using hand tools. Then they use power tools and they use the grinder. They become more and more um, confident with the repetitive tasks that construction requires. Um, and they're doing and they're learning on the ground first. So if you're afraid of heights or you might be a little bit apprehensive about using tools at heights, first we learn on the ground, which sounds pretty 
common sense, but when you first get hired, um, you don't really get to pick your job site. Uh, and the materials that we are using are mortar and mortar. When I say mortar, it means that I'm mixing my own for these and I'm using sand, lime, and cement um, to, in a different ratios to create the mix that I want. Um, when I'm working in historic buildings, knowing the type of uh, mortar that you have is really important. And when we do all of our repointing uh, on our monuments, we use a historic lime-based mortar without any cement. Um, and we also use all different kinds of patching materials depending on what, what might be broken. Okay, now they, got, they went through everything. It's time for the scaffolding to get installed. We do not put up our own scaffolding because we are not certified to do that. But I do have my students hang out and we watch and talk through all the steps necessary to put up safe scaffolding. Um, for this project, it was pretty compact, the scaffolding that we had for Delafield. Um, but it's a really great exercise to show students that have never seen it. That we go through each and every step of how to put it up and take it down properly. Um, they're, they're able to ask me, you know, why is he doing it this way? Why are they doing it this way? And we can talk through. It's also really important. Um, scaffolding is, is very important because we have to get access to many different areas of the building. Um, and the folks that put up and take down scaffolding are so important because if they make a mistake at the end of a project or the beginning, they can not just hurt themselves, but they can, you know, damage something that we've just been working really hard to uh, restore. So teaching students what to watch out for when scaffolding is going up is a really key aspect of the preservation uh, kind of uh, projects that we do. So we're, we're ready. All of our tow boards are in. Our tow boards are, are right here. All our safety grates are up. Everything's looking good. So we're ready to, to start our work. The work sequencing that we do in most of our projects is uh, clean cut, uh, wrench joints, mix our mortar, repoint, and strike. Um, it's The prep work is, is most of the work that happens on a construction site, especially when we're repointing. And for this job, because each and every joint was covered with silicone caulk, everyone had to work even harder to remove all that with hand tools. I couldn't use a grinder coming out of that. So everyone kind of got very frustrated at the repair folks of the past, but um, still made sure that we were being very safe. The cleaning that we do um, is we use a biological solution to take away a lot of the different microorganisms, microorganisms that might be growing on the monuments. And we also use a steam cleaner. Um, it is very different than a power washer. You can see uh, one of my students, Cecilia, she's using the steam cleaner right now. And the steam cleaner doesn't really use any chemicals. It's not um, operating at a very high pressure. It's operating at a very high temperature and low pressure. Um, and that's important to make sure that we don't harm the very soft marble that we're working on. And from here, you can see our cleaning results. So it's really great um, using the steam cleaner. We can have the whole building cleaned in less than a day. So when I say cut, that means we're going to cut out our joints in one of two ways. That means we're going to cut them out using the grinder, and that's Rowan, and they're cutting out, getting ready to cut out the joints with a grinder, or we're getting ready to, to use hand tools to cut out the joints. Um, so you can see there are two different ways to do it, um, and you choose which way to do it based on which way causes the less, the least amount of damage. Um, so my students learn both ways. And usually we, we are using a grinder at the end of the day to make sure that we're working at a good, efficient speed, but no one is using a grinder um, who isn't confident with it and making sure, making very, very sure that we're not gonna make more um, or damage any of our substrate while we use that kind of power tool. Um, after we cut out the joints, so you can see one of my students is rinsing out the joints. Again, not using a power washer, but using it on the hose just to make sure that there is no debris inside uh, between the bricks before we install new mortar. And then when we're getting ready to install our mortar, we're going to mix it um, as per the recommendations from the manufacturer. So we use a bagged mortar that's a historically accurate mix for the um, 
the substrate that we're working on and the time period of the building. And we're going to make sure that, you know, we have to follow the directions, right? That sounds pretty counterintuitive, but I have to say it. So mix, repoint, and strike. So when we are sort of jamming all of our mortar in between the two stones, we have an excess, and then we have to use our striking tool um, to get the finish that we want. There are many, many different tools to use to get a concave joint, a convex joint, um, all kinds of different shapes. Um, and then we have to strike it to make sure that it looks good um, and brush it out at the end. The removal of caulk, like I said, um, was a big part of this um, project. You can see we were pulling it out by hand. We could not use um, grinders for the removal of the caulk and it was very tedious. Um, when we removed all the old mortar, we had large gaps, very large joints that were filled with a high, uh, a mortar with a very high cement content. Um, and to remove that took, you know, it took the bulk of the work. Because we're in a cemetery setting, we're always dealing with the landscape. So you can see one of my students, Travis here, is excavating the one of the retaining walls that really just got inundated with so much dirt, which is just part of the part of the work we do. And here's a, a pretty good before and after. So this is in process. You can see this joint is not yet filled, but it is well on its way. And it's very, very different from the uh, work that was done in the past. So I have my new mortar that's slightly recessed so I can see the aris or edge of both stones on, on each side. And I'm not smearing it. Um, it should never look like you used your thumb to install mortar. Uh, and then our students are also certified in a proprietary patching um, material called yarn. Um, it's just a, a very, very highly well-used um, matching uh, mortar that a lot of historic buildings um, use. And so it's another one of the things that we're able to offer our students is a certification in yarn mortar uh, patching. So a lot of the students were working to match a limestone recess, and then they went on to learn about brownstone patching, marble patching, etc. So the scaffolding came off. We were able to finish our um, repointing. And that's the point where everyone sort of looks at me and says, you know, are we done? Did we do it? Um, not quite, right? So we had if you look back, you can see that we had major, our biggest joints on the roof, uh, on this rounded roof here, were very wide. They were very wide enough that I would question whether or not I wanted to uh, repeat a detail that called for a very thick, wide mortar joint that probably would crack in the future. Um, so when we make decisions to change details, especially on a roofing detail, we have to look at historical precedent. We have to look at... Um, weighing the pros and cons of making a change. And for me, if I'm going to make a change to a historic detail, I have to know that it's going to lengthen the life of the building and ultimately be better for it. Um, I don't want to repeat a bad detail. So here you can see um, me and my students prepping out the roof joints, getting ready to install lead T-caps. And a lead T-cap is exactly what it looks like. Um, it's shaped like the letter T. And it's made specifically for very wide mortar joints so that the two flanges on each end go past the mortar joint and allows for water to go off each end. And this kind of um, installation is extremely long lasting. Um, and I like to make sure that those kind of changes also kind of explain themselves. So it's also, you can see one, that's how it looks when you install it. Um, it's an, also another skill to teach students is how to do this kind of roof work. Um, and the use of lead is very uh, widespread throughout cemeteries and also historic buildings. So I'm very confident when I use it uh, within Greenwood. So again, the scaffolding came down, but we are not quite finished because we are still looking to reestablish historic elements that were missing um, from the building. And the one of the main things is it was missing its central pathway. So instead of recreating that path in asphalt or in traditional hex pavers, we decided to create um, a sort of natural rubble stone path with rocks that we found from Greenwood. Greenwood was um, 
part of a glacial moraine and there's tons of boulders and rocks within our um our soil so we have you know we just have a big rock pile and so we went through the rock pile and picked out our favorite ones um and after we did a lot of the site prep for the path so we got the digging machine in there we made sure we excavated we leveled it out made sure we had sand gravel of uh, different sizes to make sure we had drainage and then we installed um the path uh in the center and you can see that we worked together to place each each one um we set them all in uh in stone dust and that was the first step towards reestablishing um one of these lost features the second issue was with the main cast iron door so the cast iron door you can see here we removed that plywood backer and you can start to see what what um what originally was supposed to look like it had issues on the hinges and we were almost done when the door fell off of its hinges which happens uh it was corroding on both ends so it kind of forced the issue for me which was good um and we took it off and when we took it off i worked with a welder uh that's oscar uh he's my welder and uh, I didn't want to put the same stresses on the stone. You can see here that this blew out the sides of the stone. Um, I wasn't going to reattach to the same spot. So we were able to work with uh, Oscar and his team to change the design of the how the door was attached on the inside. So I wouldn't have to put continued stress uh, on the interior of that. So you can see here that the welder is installing back the door. And the door, after we took it off, was completely prepped for paint in his shop. So you can see a lot of these details are back to their original, um, very, you can, original, I mean, their original likeness is great. You can see that these little ears of corn, the upside down flames, uh, and then this one wing on this little violet, which is details that you couldn't see after years and years and years of paint. So the door was installed back where it belonged and then it was ready to get painted. So we decided to do uh, an off-white like almond color, which is in keeping with the original. And again, you can see that the original black and white photographs show a light color door. So again, it's reestablishing the original design intent of the designer and the family. Um, so that's why we went back to the light color and it looks and it looked great after we painted it you could see all of those details really come out and again this is another thing that students now have a lot of confidence that they're able to accomplish uh so we were able to do these sort of finishing touches after the scaffolding came down and they gained a whole bunch more knowledge about um how to paint how to prep how to make sure you don't get paint everywhere after you just finished a very important restoration work so that was something else um and again, here, the main thing that was missing is the missing obelisks, right? So I sort of went back to our archives and found a little little tiny slip of paper. August 17th, 1956. Vandals pushed shafts down from the side of the vaults. Repaired one shaft broken. I'm not really sure what that means, repaired one shaft broken. But to me, it shows evidence that something happened. And we did actually find these. Uh, little Kodaks that show that they had been pushed. I love this little image of this guy here. Um, I can see one is broken and one is intact. So um, mostly in the, the cemetery, when we see that things are missing, they're usually just buried very close by. So we probed um, for the obelisks and we were able to find one. I found one, the left-hand obelisk was there. So one is better than none. Um, so we proceeded with that. And from that, I made a mold of the original obelisk that we had to replicate it so I would have the pair. Um, with this, I was able to, uh, because it's a very simple shape, I didn't have to use a whole silicone mold for the whole thing. I used it just for the top. Um, so you can see I used some rigid masonite and I um, held it in place in a garbage can because you use what you have. And we were able to create um, a really good match. So we mixed everything on site, made sure that um, we had everything we needed and let it cure. And then we had to pick everything up. So this is me and my team the last couple of days making the finishing touches and hoisting the two obelisks back where they belong.
There's one all set back where she belongs. And there's the other one. And this is the replica. So they came out pretty good. And that's the finishing touches. So you can see in addition to getting the door back to the color that it should have been, creating an obelisk where there wasn't an obelisk, resetting both of them and reestablishing a central path. We were able to do all those things for this project. Um, and one of the other things that we were really able to do, which was wonderful, is reestablish a garden on both sides of the path. And we were really um, thankful that the horticulture group, our horticulture department helped us out with that um, to really make the whole thing um, really come together because sometimes you can restore a monument it looks great but without also restoring the landscape you really don't get a feel for how it once looked this is just a quick before and after of what we were presented with before um, we started work on this vault in march 2023 and this is the completion um, of the vault in may And this is the completion ceremony and it's uh it's kind of like my favorite day of the year because you're able to show off the work that the students have have done and the best thing that um that happens is that i can sort of stand around and then see how students explain to their friends and families what it is that they did um, and i like to i love to hear other people get excited about historic preservation uh historic preservation is the to me one of the coolest most important things that we could be doing um and to get other people involved in historic preservation is my job and um i love hearing people say we did this we did that and then we did this or this went wrong and then we figured it out um it was a really it's really great and down here on the on the lower side of the slide you see one of my students um they made a really great little stamp lithograph of um of the Delafield Mausoleum or vault. And it, it came out really great. So I had to include that. Um, and you can see it's really an opportunity for students to show off the work that they did with our president, our vice president, all the folks in leadership at Greenwood who really um, champion this project. So I really have to give thanks to them as well. Um, one of the main reasons why I think this programs like this are important because when you work in construction, you you increase your confidence, right? Constru learning about uh, construction and historic preservation, building restoration makes you realize that you can you can actually change things. If you don't, if things aren't working out, you change them, right? If we don't have a central path, we put one in. If we can't reach something, we use a hoist. Um, if we need to figure out how to fix a problem, we work together to, to figure out how we're going to fix a problem. So um, I love to see students of mine who are incredibly shy or uh, not knowing what they want to do with their the rest of their uh, careers. I would love it when they kind of get the idea that they can be in construction or restoration and have a lot more confidence in a lot, many different aspects of their life. So big thank you to my crew. I do not work alone. Um, Gus and Alex helped me do all the heavy lifting and all the brain work that goes into this. Um, and it's a really a group effort always at Greenwood. And this is it fully sprouted in the summer. So it was a big change. And Michelle, that's where my slides end. Um, if you wanna open it up to questions, I'm more than happy to answer some. Yeah, that was lovely. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting, I'll start. How do you choose which um, ones you're going to restore that year? Oh, great. Um, well, I usually have a short list. Um, that I'm working on and I've made my way through almost all of the marble ones. So um, when I get to my um, list for that year, I talk to my supervisor, I talk to the president, um, I, we talk out the budget and that's kind of, we choose. Um, there also is a lot of work that goes into making sure that folks who might be in the family 
um, are, we let them in on this process as well. We were very, very fortunate this year that the Delafield family actually still has members of their family. And um, Joseph Delafield was at our completion ceremony this year, which was very great because I had, you know, a family, great, great grandson there who got to meet the folks that worked on the building. Um, and my students um, also got a little bit of a thrill out of that too, because they were like, oh, you actually know the people who are buried inside of there. So it was pretty, it's pretty great for both parties. That is great. It, it is, it's lovely to know that the, uh, the families can still be involved. Yes. Um, someone said, is this free to New York City students? Is there an application process? There is absolutely an application process. It is, uh, you know, it's a rigorous, uh, we want folks that really want to get into this work um, to be included. Uh, this is a paid internship. Um, our applications are open right now um, for our 2024 cohort. And um, you can find information about the application process on Greenwood's website. Um, and the, that's another great thing about Bridge to Craft Careers is that this is a paid program, um, which is great because not everyone can afford to um, do trainings that would get these kind of certifications. Not everyone has that kind of time or um, the money to do that, to be honest. So this allows them to get paid while they're getting your OSHA training, to get paid while they're doing this work, because it is work, even though we are also um, teaching at the same time. Someone else said, what, um, also someone asked for my contact info, so I put my email in the chat just so you know it's there, um, is what influences the decision to build a vault versus a mausoleum? That's a great question. And I think um, a lot of it has to do with the topography at, at, at the cemetery and specifically at Greenwood. There's a lot of rolling hills. And um, I think um, people, it was very kind of in fashion to make these kind of in-hill vaults. Um, and we are, we are very much not a flat landscape. So if we were just a flat landscape, then folks would, I think, feel more like they needed to um, construct bigger mausoleums, which we absolutely have. But um, I think the topography of the landscape itself really influenced the type of vaults that we have built. And it was very, I mean, I think, you know, humans have always built these sort of in-wall things. Um, so it's just kind of a modern version of that. Someone said, um, did you work on the interior as well? Yeah, so we did, um, the main work that we did to safeguard the interior is actually the lead tea caps that we did on the roof because the the more secure your roofing is, making sure we don't have a lot of water infiltration. That's the best keeping keeping active water out of the inside is is the best thing that you can do. So we were able to clean up um, a lot of the flaking lime wash that was on the interior, clean up a lot of the um, crypts, but it was in pretty good shape. So we really focused mostly on the exterior. Who do you think is a good candidate for this program? Um, that's a great question. Thanks. Um, anyone who's 18 to 24, anyone who is um, looking to be a construction worker, right? This is some way. If you don't want to be a construction worker, don't do this, right? Um, I have a lot of students where I ask them, what do you want to do next year? And they're like, uh, I want to be a school bus driver. It's like, no, you want to be a school bus driver? This isn't for you. Um, so it's important that people actually want to do this. Um, when I say historic preservation or restoration, some people have different ideas about what it is. Inherently, at its core, it's construction, right? That's what I do today. Um, that's what I do at work. You know, it's it can be different because we're working on historic monuments, but at its core, um, it is absolutely construction work. So someone who's looking to um, work outside, work with, use their body, um, and are as comfortable being uncomfortable at times. Um, and um, anyone who's looking to kind of fulfill that inquisitive need to say, you know, I wonder, I wonder how that's put together, then that's someone who I'd like to hire. Are vandals still an issue at Greenwood? Oh, uh, vandals. See, vandalism takes effort, right? Um, and there's not a lot of that happening anymore because I don't know. I just think. 
teenage vandals are like otherwise occupied. But uh, no, we do get some sometimes, but it's very little. Um, we have a wonderful security staff that's uh, there all the time. So there's very little um, that happens in terms of vandalism. We definitely have more damage from storm events. Speaking of which, at this very moment, I keep kind of looking out of my window, making sure that the rain doesn't get any worse because it dictates a lot of the work that I do. We have a big storm. I'm, I have to put whatever I'm working on on hold, making sure that we're cleaning up after that that storm. That's okay, good to hear that vandalism is not that big of an issue. I'm sorry that you'll probably have a cleanup day tomorrow because it's sure. not sounding great. <laughs> Uh, someone asked, not related to Greenwood Cemetery directly, but were you a part of the Gravesend Cemetery restoration as well? I was told during one of the tours, Greenwood Cemetery people were helping with the Gravesend Cemetery restoration. Yes, uh, I was able to go to Gravesend Cemetery with um, some of my high school students a few years ago. That was 2019. Uh, that was in the before times. Uh before the pandemic. Um, I have high school students that I also work with, which is uh, with SYEP, um, Summer Youth Employment Program. And that th those students are much younger. So I keep them on the ground. Uh, they're under 18, so I don't have them do anything dangerous, not, no work on scaffolding, but we can do work on monuments, small monuments on the ground. So when I have extra hands, I don't like to use them just at Greenwood. So we go out to other cemeteries in Brooklyn, other cemeteries um, in the city on Staten Island, um, to do outreach and service days. And that's really important because if you're kind of a high school intern at Greenwood Youth, you're like, wow, this place is great. looks good. You think all cemeteries are like that. It's not like that. Unfortunately, historic cemeteries throughout the five boroughs and the, and the United States are very underfunded um, and they need a lot of help. So when we go to different places like Gravesend Cemetery, a beautiful little cemetery in South Brooklyn, um, if we do three days of work there, that's a huge um, impact. So um, we were able to work in Gravesend for a few days and um, looking forward to maybe going back there in the future. That is wonderful. That's great. I did not know that that's that you guys reach out to and work at the cemeteries. That's awesome. Um, someone says, and you were kind of just saying you need to be a construction work or want to do construction work, but they're asking, do I need to want to be a construction worker to do this internship or is having a desire to learn construction restoration techniques and experience restoration to further the preservation of historic buildings enough? I am young and still exploring options, but deeply care about architectural preservation. Yeah, it's a great way um, to get your feet wet, to figure out if it's for you. Um, definitely sounds like you can, uh, well, we should definitely be in touch. Yes, that's great. Uh, we love to have the younger people. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, are there any plans to expand the program? Yeah, so like I said, um, with the help of the World Monuments Fund, um, our, this program occurs in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. It also happens in Louisville, Kentucky at Cave Hill Cemetery and um, looking to explain, expand as a nationwide uh, model. So if you think about it, every great small town and big city in the United States has a cemetery. That means they have the ability to train folks in how to restore those monuments, and then in turn, restore the historic buildings within each town and city throughout the United States. So um, the World Monuments Fund um, is looking at how to expand this program, and it's a really great model, and I think that it's not gonna happen overnight, but it could be a way to um, really push uh, the boundaries of preservation training um, in the United States. It also allows for people, uh, many different types of people to get involved in their community. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's a great way to learn more about local and national history as well. Um, so um, in terms of expanding the program, for sure, there's always that, um, that idea that maybe it would also work in different cemeteries. That is fantastic. Um, someone says, are there tours available of the cemetery and what is demonstrated on these programs? Yeah, so we do over 200 public programs throughout the year. Um, every every year I, I host the Gay Greenwood Tour during LGBTQIA um, History Month um, in October and also in June for Pride Month. Um, we also host um, specific preservation tours where I will take a group and talk through 
my last project and then folks can see with you know and see and touch and, and look inside the building um and i can describe to them the work that we were able to do um i also do um group tours um that happens a couple of times um and also um all throughout the year i the year i work with our tour guides and our folks in the education department um to be able to let them know about the restoration department and the work that we do all year round so that um, when we have different types of tours that might be at Greenwood for one reason or another, um, they can always highlight the restoration programs and projects that we're doing. Yes, Greenwood's tours are fantastic. Highly recommend. Vero is great. Um, also, Woodlawn, if you just want to go hang out at the cemeteries, they're all great. Um, so the, the restoration projects that you guys do, is it just you and your team with the bridge to crafts or is there a separate restoration? Like, are there other restorations happening at the same time? So I run the restoration department 365 days a year, right? I'm there doing this work. Uh, bridge to crafts careers is only 10 weeks of that. Um, it's a very small part of the restoration that, uh, that we do on a yearly basis. Um, it's when we do uh, kind of a bigger project because it's a great way to, for the students to learn. Um, but we usually do a, a couple of um, mausoleums a year. Um, I just do them without students, which is a lot faster. <laughs> um, so it's, it's great to do these training programs, but the real kind of work happens every day when I'm responding to many different um, inquiries. So we have perpetual care that needs to be taken care of on a yearly basis. We have any repairs that are happening because of um, storms that roll in, other things like that. And um, we're a huge place. We're 478 ac acres with over 560,000 people buried um, and each one of those people has some sort of monument, right? So it's a, it's a ton of stuff to look after. Um, so there is a lot of restoration happening all the time. What has been your favorite restoration project so far and why? Oh, uh, hmm. Mm. Um, I love working on um, public lots. So there are sections of the cemetery that are full of huge mausoleums, um, big family lots for famous people and all that. And that's great. They've gotten a lot of attention over the years. They usually don't need the work because they already look fine. Um, so that's why I like to work on the opposite of that, which are our public lots. Public lots are um, the lots that if you were new to this country in the 1800s um, and you could only afford the minimum to bury a loved one, that's where someone was selling you a plot. So um, if if you were an immigrant, if you were a, a poor person in the green in New York and Brooklyn, you could only afford um, one lot, right, which is a single grave lot. And these have very small headstones, if any at all, um, but they make up about one third of the cemetery, which is a huge amount. Um, and throughout the cemetery, you can see that there are sections where all of these headstones, because they are not built on a foundation because they're so small, they've kind of leaned a little bit or they've fallen over entirely and they've sunken into the ground. So I really like to work on those smaller monuments because I can. we can do a lot of them. We can go lot by lot and make a huge visual difference in the, in the landscape. All of a sudden, it looks like 200 headstones just appeared out of nowhere because um, they have. They were all buried. And then when we bring them up, um, it's a huge change. So that to me, um, doing 200 small repairs um, during the summer um, can be even, even more impactful than restoring one mausoleum to one rich family that probably was a little bit, you know, questionable in the, for the, in the to begin with. Makes sense. <laughs> Uh, do you need to be in your early 20s to get into this type of work, monument restoration, etc.? Very curious about how do you get into this and where do you start? Um, so I have uh, an architectural history or an uh, architecture and architectural history and conservation science background and a construction background. Um, and to become a conservator, you need a professional background or you need experience, right? So if you want, if you want to start out your career, it doesn't matter how old you are, you just have to be physically able to do the work. Um, but to participate in Bridge to Crafts careers, that program specifically, we do have a funding um, 
specifications that we are catering to 18 to 24 year olds within the, um, our community. I think that is the last one and we are just at seven o'clock. So I will say thank you very much, Neela. This was fascinating. This is very, very interesting. Uh, thank you ever, everyone for joining us tonight. Um, again, this has been recorded, so it will be up on our YouTube channel. I will send you all the link when it is posted. Um, please do check out all of our other programming, our videos, uh, virtual walking tours, other preservation classes. And like I said, we have another one coming up in two weeks. Please check out our website, hdc.org. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good night.